So welcome to everybody listening now and in the future. Um, today, we are very fortunate to have a, a new lecturer from someone who's new to our community. And so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kate White, and I'm the, the founder and director of the Pre and Perinatal Healing Online School, where I run the school with my husband, Brett, and he's down here and Brett Harris. And it is um, our great fortune to know near Estermon. And we have been building a community of people uh, that all have a touch, a touchstone in pre and perinatal, the pre perinatal time. So our community is a wide variety of professionals, people who specialize in pre and perinatal somatics, but also early childhood educators, uh, midwifery students, practitioners, birth professionals, counselors of all kinds, people who practice somatics, including yoga instructors. And now we are introducing to our community the work of Nir Estermont. So this particular lecture is called Shadows in the Clinic. And I'd just like to introduce Nir by, by reading his biography. Nir Estermont is the developer of Shadow Constellations, a teacher of family constellations and embodied shadow work, and a body psychotherapist in the Granger Method. He developed shadow constellations from his 20 years of practice and personal experience, which includes overcoming cancer at the age of 22, years of supporting professionals from the healing and development fields, and having a full practice for over 14 years. Nier's passion is developing interdisciplinary approaches for being present, compassionate, trauma-aware, and embodied, with a multi-dimensional approach to healing. Nier is based in Israel and teaches internationally. He is a staff member of the Constellation Path Institute for Systemic Constellations and the online Systemic Trauma University. Nir is a presenter at various professional conferences. So please go ahead, Nir. Thank you, Kate. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Can you hear me well? Good. So I'm excited to be with you here today some of you have already met and some of you it's the first time and as Kate said today we will be talking and having some experience with shadow constellations and with the shadow that uh, runs a part of what happens in our clinic with our clients and with, with our students and we're in for an hour and a half and uh, I'll try to keep the theory to a minimum uh, so we'll have more time for experience sharing questions and answers. Uh, I do invite you to hold in mind that as Kate said before this meeting is recorded and Kate is recorded in speaker mode right? Um, yes so only yeah. only near will be showing up unless you speak and for those of you who are here, if you just want to put near on the screen, you can choose the speaker. So the speaker view up in the upper right hand corner, you can click on speaker, yeah. which will bring him in full. Okay. So you can feel comfortable to, to move, to shake, to rest, to change posture, to get a drink, to eat if you're hungry. And so please take good care of yourselves uh, while we're having this journey together. Um, I'd also like to invite you to feel comfortable if something that I say doesn't resonate or it doesn't feel right for you. You don't have to take it just because I'm in the teacher's position today and check within yourself uh, if it feels relevant and resonating great, take it in. But if it doesn't, um, you don't have to, or you can raise your hand and ask and, and we'll see how to negotiate a difference um, if that's possible. Um, we are organized this uh, and this free talk in advance of a training. I'll speak about a training very shortly at the end of the of the talk, so you don't have to worry about um, being bombarded with marketing ideas throughout the session. Just know it's somewhere over there at the end. I'll give it some uh, three or five minutes. Um, and my intention for you is first to experience. Uh, shadow work, shadow constellations, um, to take something for yourselves, your professional self, your personal self from this um, 
time we'll have together so that you're not just listening, you're also participating in experiencing. Um, to have fun during that time and to have enough uh, of a felt sense whether you like to go deeper with this, with this work or not. Um, sometimes when I'm excited or tired, I'm only excited now, not tired, I, I speak a little bit too fast or not clear enough. If that happens, your ears are fine. Please raise your hand and let me know that I got carried away with my excitement. Um, so as Kate said, I developed shadow constellations from over 20 years of working with people. Um, and it had many stages inside it from doing uh, mostly body work and uh, with having no theoretical background about what happens underneath the, the visible and, and in addition to what I can see in the body. Um, no one told me there are things like transference and current transference or and why things get complicated between me and my clients or why with some clients I seem to be doing really well, but with some other clients, something is not working. And it's not because they're necessarily more traumatized than others. Like this. Something just gets me more triggered or less present. Um, or with less energy, or in some other cases, with too much energy and too much involvement. And I needed to find um, a framework for me to understand what's going on. Um, I'm also a main provider for my family. So I had during the years, uh, the need to understand how to maintain high levels of energy to be able to quickly recognize when something triggers me or affects me in such a way that I'm losing my focus, losing my presence, losing my level, lowering my level of energies. Um, and then naturally I have less clients or clients who come less, uh, which is, I guess, for most of us, not a very desirable situation. Um, Yeah, so I come from there and I come from the world of the shadow as a, developed originally by, by Carl Gustav Jung, the Swiss psychoanalyst, psychiatrist, student of Freud, and the big disappointment of Freud, and a very interesting, charismatic, deep, dark, troubled person who brought us many interesting things, including you know, collective archetype types and including um, the ability to look at people and sort of categorize them in some ways, which is not always good, but is sometimes useful. Um, Jung was quite a character. Probably today he would have been hospitalized in an early age with delusions and, and all kinds of uh, interesting um, experiences about reality. Luckily, he lived uh, in an earlier age, so we get to enjoy his genius. And um, despite him being quite complicated in today's um, ethics, very unethical, including having sexual relationships with uh, clients and, and stealing academic uh, uh, credits and some other things. I'll not go at length into that just to say that is an inspiration, but a quite um, challenging inspiration. And, and, and we need to choose what we take from him as well. Um, when I first met Shadow Work, I felt like, oh, every major step I've done in my personal process went through some form of that. Because the shadow is composed of what we deny and what we repress what we disown. The self parts that we, at a very young age, understood to be endangering our belonging, and therefore we chose to cut them off, or at least we tried. We can't really cut off self parts. What we can do is isolate them, internally disconnect. In a way, in order to belong to our family and to our culture, we choose 
again, not fully consciously, but still we choose to take some self parts and lose our inner belonging instead of having the amazing experience of all my parts belong to me. Every single part has a home within me, which is an ideal, okay? I'm not the rider, just saying it's a really amazing experience when we even get close to it. Instead of that, we choose to belong to our family, to our parents, to be protected, to be cared for, to be loved, even if we're prized, to be appreciated, even in certain ways and not others. Um, you know, survival. And somewhere in our lizard brain, um, we are first and foremost survival um, oriented. Only when we have our survival needs met, we can go on and develop and explore and be curious, right? Yeah. So I developed this work when I noticed that sometimes I lose empathy for clients. And while we can recover from that and, and gain some deep insights and, and progress in therapy, it's not always what happen, what happens. And with some clients, it, op it happens too often. So there's something going on, maybe with them, probably with me. I wanted to develop the ability to work with a broader range of issues and clients because what is in our shadow, we can't really meet. If it's deeply, deeply in our shadow, interestingly, our potential clients would sense that and they would just go to someone that can contain this, that can stay in the same room with these issues or these aspects of themselves. Some other clients would also notice that, but because they would like so much something that we do bring, would come to us and work with us, only they would have to split. They would bring to the clinic, to the work, their parts that we feel comfortable with, that we approve of, that we at least can handle well. And they will leave out the parts that are too difficult for us, which sometimes is a bit of a tragedy because they come to us to be more whole and then they have to first split and then be more whole on just a part of themselves. And probably anyone here who have been working with clients for more than five years had that, that interesting experience when you're having a certain number of clients and then in your therapy or in your training or, in, or through some other way, you experience a big shift in something. You reconnect with something in yourself. You go through a difficult event. You 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 get in, get in touch with some trauma and integrate it with some shadow and integrate it. And suddenly, some of your clients this same week open a new topic that until you've met it yourself was not present. And suddenly, three or five clients in the same week just suddenly begin to talk about sexuality or anger or abandonment or having power or domination or whatever. And what happened? How did they know? Well, they always know, don't they? Maybe they're not aware, but they know. So basically, I developed the work to become deeper and safer therapist, facilitator and teacher. And while doing that, I realized that it's really nice of me to think of my clients, but actually I'm doing it for myself as well, because when I do that, I become nicer to my wife, or at least I can evade some of the fights. I can be more okay with different ways in which my children are acting because they're actually doing things which are in my shadow. They're being helpless or they're being provocative or they're being uh, too loud or taking too much space. And, oh, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> it's not them doing something that wrong. It's me being really annoyed and triggered because I wasn't allowed to be that. Hmm. 
how it becomes interesting. It allows me to be a better friend, to have a deeper sense of inner peace because I'm more at peace with more parts of myself. And again, it's more. Okay, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not any kind of Buddha, not, nor pretending to be. I'm just striving for more. For doing deeper work, for being in deeper peace with myself. And to be able to not just be a great therapist who comes home and is an asshole, and, but a good enough therapist to come home and is a good enough person. Basic, basic needs, I call that. Our, how uncommon is that? Um, so, why did you come today? What did you hope to gain from today's meeting? Please write in the chat in one sentence. You don't have to go into depth. Just, what are you here for? Is it for yourself mostly? For your clients mostly, 50-50. Is there something specific that you would have liked to get out with when you leave this meeting today? I'll try to be in touch with that if you let me know. So to gain insight for personal and for clients. Learn a little bit about shadow work for my cell phone, for my clients as well. For clients, for self, for others. Learn and perceive other aspects of the shadow. More understanding for myself and in professional roles to learn about shadow work. Honestly, naming and validation. Oh, nice. To remember and learn new things that you didn't taught me and meet your new energy again. Oh. Thank you, Sophie. And there are some past students uh, jumping in to visit. Relationship to perinatal issues for both. I'll try to do that. I'm not a perinatal therapist myself, but we're working on that. Um, I've experienced this work as a client, but always benefit from understanding the context more and for myself and my clients. To understand better how constellation shadow work and make me and those I serve be a better PP and E and a labyrinth activist. Curious about your process and deep understanding around how to work with shadows and clients. Learn to new way new ways to work with the shadow. Okay, stop reading. Thank you for giving me a frame of what is it that you are uh, here today for. And um, I hope you'll get at least something of that. Um yeah. So the shadow. I like to look at the shadow as an area, a dimension, if you like, some space in our body, mind, soul, whatever, into which we push those self parts that we deny, disown, um, and repress. When something is truly and fully in the shadow, we can't really be in touch with it. it. We'll need to go through some things in life usually in order to touch something which is really 100% in the shadow, okay? Um, when we try to do that, we, we forget. We have this experience, you try to get in touch with something and then you forget that you wanted to get in touch with it and then you commit to yourself and maybe to your partner or to your therapist and then you forget again. Uh, or just something happens outside or external, of course, every time you try to get in touch with that, that's because it's too much in the shadow. But there are lots of things which are in partial shadow. Let's say 10% light, 90% shadow, or 50 and 50. And those things we can get in better touch with. And when we do that, some interesting things happen. How do we even know we have the shadow running and what's happening in, in our clinic. But actually lots of ways because the shadow is very prominent in our lives, in every relationship. 
maybe the most known one and talked about is that we get judgmentally motivated. Instead of, if, instead of having compassion, empathy, a wide perspective, we suddenly feel like we have a judgment or a very clear idea on what a client should be like, and they're not. Um, a strange need to educate them a little bit beyond psychoeducation. Um, a sense of superiority sometimes, like we can't understand why they're doing this or not doing that. Well, you know, normal people or good people or sane people would, or people who love themselves would. Sometimes we want to physically shake them. In some cases, when it's really bad, we want to strangle them um, until they understand or until the DNA leaves the human, the human genome. And depending on how much in the shadow is what we project onto them. Um, sometimes we feel dislike, disgust. We, want, like, we don't want to work with people like that. Have you ever had that experience? There are some clients that you feel like, I don't want to work with clients like this. They are for other people. Eh, yuck. Right? I only want to work with clients who are, and then I have a list of my good clients, yeah? <laughs> but what happens with the not good enough clients? Are they really not good enough? Or is it me not being able enough to be in touch with certain things? Um, we can sense the presence of the shadow, as I said before, and what we forget. You, you know that when, at the end of one session, we tell the client, okay, we've done this today. Next session, we, we will work on that. And then next session comes and we don't work on that. We actually forget or they forgot or we forget everything that happened. Well, that's some of the shadow for you. Sometimes we see the shadow um, when we want to give up on clients because they feel too complex. heavy, too difficult, we're not sure how to handle that, maybe we don't have enough experience, we start to doubt our ability or professionalism. And maybe sometimes for a good reason, maybe we should learn something more or, or go and get supervision. But in my experience, very, very often what actually happens is that the clients are feeling helpless. And we helpless in the shadow mostly we don't like being helpless right we like to be in a position uh, of help with the ability to help our clients and then through what psychologists would call uh, projective identification and what we call just being captured and um, we experience their helplessness as if it was ours and then what happens we don't know what to do with these clients who are helpless and we believe this helplessness because we're not enough in touch with our own shadows of helplessness. The first time if I, I understood this mechanism, I was still doing only body work, no shadow work or, or family constellation. So 15 years ago, I was working with a client and I was physically working on his left hand without talking, just trying to get in touch with the experience that was held in there because it was painful. And in my head all the time, there were these thoughts running of, I should probably refer him to my teacher. I'm, I'm not really, I don't really know what I'm doing here. I need someone else to take control, to take over. And then I had a, um, a touch of the genius coming to me and I asked him, hey, where are you now? And he said, in my mind, I'm 15 years back during my basic training in the Israeli army. And we're doing this forced march of 20 or 30 kilometers. And at the end, we are opening stretchers and putting someone heavy on the stretcher and we carry them. And it's really heavy and I can't carry it any longer. And I'm just waiting for someone to replace me. And I was like, 
oh, I also feel that it's too much and it's too heavy and I can't carry it anymore and I just want for someone to replace me. Whoa. <laughs> um, so instead I've explored it a, a bit more in depth and I saw how helplessness doesn't only take us to tell clients to go away to someone more experienced. It can also make us become um, very strongly uh, trying to save them. So going into the savior mode or trying to shake them out of their helplessness and misery. So becoming a perpetrator. And sometimes because we can't be in touch with your helplessness, we just don't notice it. We're working with, we're working with clients and and we don't see that they can deal with something. And that's because we're captured or being in touch with the silent accomplice, with those who should have seen and should have known that something is going on, but didn't or couldn't. <sighs> I can go on for a long time, I actually do it in the training, so I'll stop here. Uh, um, with that and just say that there are many other ways in which the shadow influences the clinic including attraction erotic attraction sexual attraction including getting really tired um, yeah and some others the shadow have roots some of the roots as I said before our inner childhood, what was accepted, what was frowned upon, what made our mom say, go away from me, or disconnect internally, and we were left alone just because we cried or just because we puked or something. But some of it go further because there is a reason that our parents or family or culture we're not able to stay present with us. It's because whatever it is that we had in us was already in their shadow. And it was in their shadow because at some point in history, could be their own history and could be the history of their ancestors, some trauma happened. And we are left in the shadow of that trauma. After the trauma, some things were not allowed anymore. Some things felt like they would endanger life itself or endanger belonging to that society, to that culture, to that tribe. Sometimes we know. We know that grandpa uh, had lots of money, but he was also uh, an alcoholic and a gambler, and he lost all the money, and now we were stuck uh, being poor. Uh, so we know to be in control and never to let go of control or never to be an addict or anything or to be responsible, right? Because we know where that ends. And sometimes we don't know because we don't know that great-grandma lost two children in the war and because it was before she met a uh, great-grandpa and no one talked about that. But her grief, her undigested grief is still alive in the family and we still can't talk about the army or we still can't be fully alive because deep inside we're still carrying the grief. And if we will be fully alive and happy, then we will not be in touch with great grandma. And who wants not to be in touch with great grandma, right? Again, unconsciously. And on the soul level. So family, this is where family constellations comes in because in one sentence, family constellations are developed by Bert Hellinger, allow us to take the difficult burdens the disconnections and the grief, the horror and murder, the pain, the war, the, the famine, the migration, and turn it for some, from something that is destroying our life to a source of power, a source of support, source of comfort, of belonging. And sh the shadow is a very clear and distinct doorway into this kind of feeling. So family constellations come here on, on two levels. On one level, they open the entire intergenerational or ancestral level of trauma healing. 
And additionally, they offer us a modality, a practical way of working with both self-powered work and inter intergenerational trauma healing combined. So I think this is enough of a presentation. Hmm. It's becoming fire in here. <laughs> I wonder what will come up now. <sighs> so I'm taking a moment to regulate myself after having my notes for today almost catching on fire. <sighs> okay. So maybe let us continue into doing some form of work but you can have an experience. Mm. And we will go through the easiest way to meet our shadow. And the easiest way to meet our shadow is through the judgment, through the projection, through the clients that for some reason we're really triggered by. So please take a moment to think about a client. It could be a current client or someone from the past. And if you can't find a relevant client, it could be a co-student, a teacher. And please don't take your parents or your partner for this short exercise, okay? There are just more issues than time to work with when we do that. And so we're looking for someone that triggers us. But when we think about this person, we become judgmental. We become annoyed. I feel like if they could only change, or why are they so much like that? I can't stand it in them. Maybe it feels like we want to shake them into understanding what's wrong with them. And maybe we just want them to go to the room and think about it and come back as good children. So it could take different forms. Just make sure it's someone that you feel that you are annoyed by, that you're judgmental of, but it didn't hurt you in, in a clear way. So if they are like um, devaluing, devaluing you all the time uh, or being aggressive towards you or shaming you, then don't take them because you're hurt. And of course you're triggered by that. Try to find clients who say, okay, I know they're not horrible people, but I." There's some, either I can't stand them or I can't stand something in them. Okay? It doesn't have to be the, all of them, but something in them is difficult for me. And take a moment to stay present, imagining in your mind's eye or seeing in your mind's eye yourself and that client. And notice how you feel when you're looking at that client, what is your embodied reaction to being in the presence of that client? What happens to your breathing? Are you open or closed? Is there any wish to move or do something in your body? Do you feel any strong emotions? Do you feel yourself more embodied or less embodied when you're facing that line? What thoughts run through your head? What images? What scenes? Maybe there are sounds or noises or music that you seem to hear. Maybe some memory comes up. Don't have to do anything about it. Just notice your reaction to that client. Notice what would you like to do to this client if you could do anything. 
if no one will know, if you will forget, what does your inner non-politically correct um, beast part of you wants to do when you see something like that in front of you? And I will not ask you to share if you don't want to, so you can be honest with yourselves. And now take a breath and still in your mind's eye, sort of gently disengage from your, from your own position. So look at the both of you from the side for a moment. Take a breath and get back to your body. And then move to the other side. For a moment, make yourself stand in, their, in your client's shoes. How does it feel to be your client? be in your presence when this is how you feel? How much of what you feel leaks to the client? How does it affect how they feel emotionally, how safe they feel? What reactions does it elicit from them? What do they want to do in their body? And take another breath and gently disengage. Take a moment to see if the images of yourself and your client wants to move in your mind's eye. Maybe get closer or more distant, change the angle between you two. And allow them to move or to change, maybe even change shape, to look different. Don't force anything, just notice if it is naturally happening, then allow it. And then go back to your own image. We call it representation constellation. So go back to your own representation. And notice how you feel towards your client now. Is there perhaps any change just by standing in their shoes for a couple of moments? Maybe yes, maybe no, all is fine. Now let's add a third image, a third representation. Listen carefully. This one is for what makes them so triggering. So it's an image or representation for the exact quality that you find so triggering in them. Maybe you know what it is, maybe you still don't know and that's okay. Just invite your unconscious to supply a relevant image and place that image standing one step to the side from your client's representation. So now you're standing in front of your client and to their, let's say, left. There is that thing which this is what you can stand about. It. Notice where is your attention? Is your attention now? mostly on your client or has it moved, has it shifted to be more focused on a triggering aspect of the client? If it has moved, bravo, there is a shadow of yours over there, a big enough one. If it hadn't moved yet or if it's well split, well split between the two, then maybe there is something else it is so triggering about it, client, and you can add a representation for it as well. Until you feel that your attention is, or enough of your attention is moved from the client itself to the triggering aspects of the client. 
but very often one is enough. Don't don't try to look for more. Once your attention moved, it's a sign. Have a look at your clients. Do you feel any different about them now? Once there is again clearer distinction between themselves and the triggering aspect. Yeah, could be. And take another breath and add a fourth representation. This one is for this same triggering aspect of the client, only this time in yourself. Even if you don't know that you have it, it's okay. Repression, right? But still. Invite a representation for it to come and position it next to you in front of their triggering aspect. And now again, notice. Where is your attention focused on mostly now? The client? their triggering aspect or your triggering aspect. When it, you're focused on your triggering aspect, you know that you've hit one of your shadows. Imagine yourself turning to your shadow. Notice how it feels to look at it face to face. Is it scary, exciting? Do you want to push it away? Say it's not yours. Do you feel like maybe there is some opening to get in touch with it? Notice if it feels easy to look at it or does it feel difficult? In your mind's eye, try telling your shadow the following sentence. You are also a part of me. Notice what happens when you try to say that sentence. How does it ring? Probably it doesn't ring fully well. So do the following. Add a representation or something or someone that is a resource or a support for yourself. And position them behind your image. So you're standing in front of the shadow and behind you supporting you. There is some person or some resource. Maybe it's someone or something you know to be supporting. And maybe you just let your unconscious decide what it will be that supports you. Notice how it feels now. Is there any change in how you relate to your shadow now? Maybe try the sentence again. Does it feel different now? Let's do it again. Let's add another representation for support or resource behind the first one. So now we have two standing in line behind us, supporting us. How does that feel? Is there perhaps more ease, more power, more ability 
get in touch with this shadow? How does the sentence, you are also a part of me, feels now? Let's do it again. Let's have a third representation for support or a resource. What does it feel now? What is different as you add resources and supports? How does the sentence taste on your tongue now? You're also a part of me. For some of us, it's already easy to say. For some of us, it may still feel difficult. So please go ahead and add one, two, three, or more representations for support and resources, lining them one behind the other until you feel supported enough. Don't think about it. Don't try to analyze it. Just add as many resources and supports as you need until you feel something moves inside you. Until you feel like, oh, okay, maybe I can or I sure can and do and want to or maybe okay i'm not gonna die maybe someday it will be possible <laughs> before i thought it's gonna kill me now i think that maybe i can do it that's also a positive change right and if for whatever reason no number of, of supports and resources help and you still feel like it's not possible, that's also okay. Just tell your shadow, hey shadow, I still can't say, you're also a part of me. I'm not there yet. That's also okay. Notice how you feel about your shadow now. Notice if there is any movement asking to happen between you two, any change. Notice the flow of energy between yourself and your shadow. Are you feeling its presence? How do you feel about it? If you feel like having physical contact with it, you may do, you may do so. Sometimes we feel like hugging or touching hands or standing next to each other, shoulders touching or anything else you feel is right. Notice how it feels when you change your relation to your shadow. What is changing in the body? And now please turn back towards your client, the one with whom we began this journey. Don't lose your hold on the shadow. You can still be in touch with it. It's here anyway. But go back to look at your client and notice how do you feel about your client now? Has anything shifted in how you look at your client and how you feel with your client? Notice the atmosphere in the room. Is there perhaps something more possible now than before or maybe something that shouldn't have been very possible is now not so possible
notice if there is a change in how well you sit in the therapist or facilitator or practitioner chair. How comfortable are you now in your position in relation to this client? And if you feel so, please tell your client the following sentence. I was triggered by you because I was triggered by this triggering aspect of yours. And I was triggered by it because I was not in touch with it inside me. I am more in touch with it in myself now. So I can be more present here for you. I can see you better now. Notice how it feels to say it. And then gently disengage from your own representation. Take a breath and turn yourself and step on the representation of your client. We have a first body experience of what it feels for them when we do our shadow work. How does it feel now to be in your presence as your clients? Is there a change in how it feels in the body? How safe it feels? How open it feels? And gently disengage from your client and from this entire in your mind's eye constellation, shadow constellation. A nice, deep, full breath. And when you exhale, gently land back here in our virtual room together. Taking a moment to settle down, to feel your body. Notice your feet touching the ground, floor. The chair, the back of the chair. Mm. How was it for you? Would you like to share your experience, what you found out? A meaningful moment, a difficulty? Do it in writing in the chat and also unmute yourself and share with your own voice if you like. I already read it was whoa, powerful, heart opening, compassion and tears. Thank you, Connie. Yeah, I was, sure. I was um, in the process and did what you said the best that I could and I found myself getting sleepy and I'm thinking, am I, am I falling asleep on my own shit in my own shadow process here? Um, and I'm wondering, it almost felt hypnagogic to me. Yeah. It's 
So the shadow is somewhere at the edge of our consciousness. And one of the typical shadow triggerings are becoming tired, falling asleep, becoming heavy. Uh, like this uh, joke about a uh, patient spilling their guts and a psychologist falling asleep. And it's not because they're bored, it's because they've been shadow triggered, but no one told us that. Um, yeah, the constellation in the mind, so I can sometimes feel a bit hypnotic as well. They're not actually hypnotic, but they are going to some deep place inside us. So it's perfectly fine if you fell asleep or you fell sleepy. Um, different shadows would elicit different reactions from you, working with different people, working with, with groups or with different partners, you will have different experiences. Mm. Aileen, please. Um, my experience when um, uh, you asked me to look at my shadow is I was not even willing to turn and look. And um, as you were asking um, to bring in supports, the first couple supports didn't help. And then, you know, I, I've been working with you and I, what I brought in was the way that you joke and laugh about the shadow. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was this humor that came in. And when the humor came in, then I was able to look because it didn't feel so threatening. Um, it felt very threatening to look at that shadow. And um, by the end of um, the experience, um, when we were, when I was just reflecting, I was thinking about a conversation I was having with a parent of a child um, just this week um, who was working with me professionally. And, and I said, in the beginning, just do it yourself and just show him how he would do it. You know, don't force him to do it. Don't expect him to do it. Just model it and he will eventually he'll just learn how to do it just as he's learned many other things. And that's where the compassion came in. I mean, there's still kind of a hard part that still puts myself above this client. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm interested in working with that. But there was also that neutral place that knows when something is modeled with compassion and, and it, from that neutral place that, um, that is something that is most effectively then um, internalized by somebody else. So, thank you. Thank you, Eileen. I consider you more a very important resource. I, I use it a lot, uh, sometimes a little bit too much, but I try to keep, to keep the balance. And sometimes when things are just too horrible to face, humor is our best ally. Um, and I'm coming from Israel and from parents who were children in the Holocaust. Imur, best friend. Thank you. Iran, please. Uh, yeah, I uh, was thinking about my client who uh, I felt uh, just tries very hard, too hard. And then I uh, I realized that uh, it's a shadow in me for me for, to be trying very hard for something. And then, but then it also put me in touch with the uh, vulnerability and uh, the feeling of smallness where it comes from. Uh, feeling scared that I'm not, uh, that there's a gap, that, uh, so therefore trying very hard. So as soon as I was, I got in touch with that, I think the shadow, I don't know the sh which, which part of shadow, but I think the shadow was the vulnerability and the scaredness of being too small for the situation or the context and therefore trying very hard, I felt a rush of compassion. I felt a rush of compassion for her and for me, and 
um, I just visualize like myself putting hands on shoulders of a younger, smaller me, and that felt very reassuring. And um, in terms of resources, I realized that it's, it's like difficult, but even the opportunities are my resources. The fact that I got an opportunity and something in the universe has faith uh, that I can do it, I can rise to it, is a resource. Uh, my family is a resource. And, uh, and then I just felt a lot of compassion for myself and for my family. Thank you, Rani. So really, one of the signs for the shadow is that we try too hard. Like there is something unspoken or un, unacknowledged in the room, which has effects. And if instead of being able to relate to it, we try to compensate for it. Um, and it's also a sign that there is something in the shadow here. And uh, yes, very, very often, the shadow is created at a very young age and when we are under-resourced and under danger of being excluded from the family. <laughs> so when we can resource ourselves and get in touch with our family, with the bigger aspect of the family, uh, it's a very big resource. And then we are able to get back to that self part and say, okay, now, now, now we can meet, now we can embrace each other, now we can get in touch. Thank you. Claudia, please. Thank you for having me here. Um, so I have a, a client of mine who uh, was, she was actually choked by her, her partner. And, uh, you know, I, I know that she reminds me of my mother. <laughs> she has these mother whiffs. Um, and I've done a lot of uh, constellation, family constellations uh, with my mother. I'm able to take life from my mother, uh, but there's still some nuances there that are um, almost like a glimmer, you know? Uh, and I, I work well with this client, but it's, um, you know, w w when you had us to, you know, doing this exercise, I felt like, um, there was a small child, uh, and I know this about her because I, I see it. I'm, I'm a craniosacral therapist, so my work is very, uh, and I do some out of emotional release. And I can see this, you know, her child part just coming out and like, save me, save me. And um, we've, we've, we've worked on different aspects of that. But what I was uh, surprised about was how when I opened myself up to that shadow that my throat, you know, somatically like just started to close off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, oh, there's more work to be done. Mm -hmm. I'm getting on the table after this session myself and allowing someone else to work on me. <laughs> yeah. We'll be curious to to see what what comes up. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I get I I think everyone that is working with other people, right? We we um there's there are all there's always a reason why a client comes to you and at least for myself i know that we 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 get so much from our clients sometimes things that we don't want like the shadow you know to and it can be difficult to 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 look at these and also to integrate them so um it was very meaningful to me to be able to to work with that um, in a safe space. And I loved when you started to bring in the resources. I just kind of saw my my generations of, you know, um, family members coming out and just placing their hands on my back and telling me, you've got this, you know, that was very supportive. And oddly enough, I, I don't do that every single session is to bring in my ancestral strength to each and every one of my clients and i do have to remember that because we we do have a lot of help out there um prior to meeting these you know different trauma aspects and others and, and ourselves as well you know just kind of sitting in that uh, space of um it's okay to look at the shadow and to and to see it you know so thank you very much i appreciate this thank you um, 
would you like me to offer one small thing you could do with this client even right now yes okay so again imagine yourself and the client in front of you notice how you feel towards her including that glimmer of mother you're in touch with that and now please imagine a representation for your own mother standing behind your left shoulder a pace away and don't turn to her just notice what happens between you and your client when your actual mom is acknowledged How does it feel now? Um, it feels like my mother is uh, trying to fight for me and ward off <laughs> a lot of <laughs> things. <laughs> In fact, she herself is a very small child. She's done no work on herself. And I feel weighted, like I'm being pulled back on the mm. left, I'm kind of leaning to the left and being pulled back. Uh, yeah. So she's definitely someone that um, How do you feel now about the client? That I can see her and meet her where she's at without being distracted of the parts that I'm working on separately in that. Okay. You know, the discernment, right, of what is mine, what is hers, right? Yeah. Thank you. Mm. So there's actually lots of things we can do as a sort of self-supervision with this kind of work um, or offer supervision to others if we are and doing that anyway. Um, because it really helps us to, to be very clear and be able to distinct well between what belongs to whom and, and how to work with that. We have about, let's see, 22 minutes. So I'd like to ask if anyone has any question. Yes, no, wait. Hi. Uh, I came in a bit late, so I just, I came in the middle of the exercise. So I just wanted to, think, before I say what I have to say, I just wanted to mm -hmm. clarify that. Mm -hmm. Um. So in my, I worked a lot with images and imagery. So I have a very easy time responding to the suggestion of the imagination. One of the things that I, I had a difficulty with the word shadow. Mm -hmm. Because when I see the shadow, that's my, my own difficulty. It has, it has boundaries but it doesn't have a face and it doesn't, it looks like a shadow. Mm. So, okay. so I, I just I wanted to say that could be my own thing, but I just wanted to say that that word, and then when I was hearing you talk with um, somebody would, whose name I don't know about the Holocaust, I mean, it just came to me that maybe this is related to some sort of uh, association to something a bit nightmarish so that's all mm -hmm. I have to say so thank you for bringing this aspect Let, let's see what I have to say about it um first the first 20 25 minutes of this meeting were dedicated to describing uh, what it what I mean when I say the shadow oh okay so I'm sorry and, no, that's okay. That's okay. And during the exercise, when we got to the part where you can look at your shadow, it was already clear that it is self, it's a self part or, a, or, or an aspect. Okay. Okay. And, but I think that beyond being lay law, you're actually touching on something very important because what you sense is very often how we see not a specific shadow, but the archetype of the shadow. Okay. The sum of all shadows. And so when the shadow with the capital S is, is being embodied in our imagery, 
then sometimes it looks like that. Sometimes people have dreams with someone dark without a face following behind them. That's the shadow archetype. Okay. Um, so what you saw is real and to the degree that we can talk about the psyche as real. Um, uh, uh, so well, thank you for adding this as well. <laughs> yeah. Any other question or sharing that you would like to have before I'll describe the training shortly? I put it in the chat, Nur, but I, I'm wanting to be clear with my both my professional and my personal writing. And how can this shadow work be adapted to that? Okay. So... I'm, I'm not sure what you're interested in regarding your professional and, and personal writing. And I'll just say what comes up for me around that. Um, I noticed during my own processes that the more I got in touch with my aggression, which is very much in the shadow in my family, and uh, my writing, I don't know if it became better, but it became better accepted. So maybe I wrote with the same degree of uh, compassion and nicety, but people seem to read me more, react more, and want more to uh, enlist to my trainings. Um, so that's maybe a partial answer, but I hope it's useful. Um, in, in general, when we are writing, for sure, as a, in a professional way, we're actually writing uh, from our professional persona. And our professional persona, like any persona, is something that we build in order that our shadow will not be seen. Uh, so writing from the persona is maybe limiting in some ways. Uh, and the more we can get in touch with our sh different shadows, depending on the topic that you find difficult or the embodiments you find difficult to write from, then we can have a much wider range of options to write from. Sometimes I can write very gently and nicely. Sometimes I can write very clearly. Sometimes I can write um, and I can be in touch with the shadow of the person who reads it. Oh, this is too much for this person's shadow. <laughs> I have to change it to something that they can read through and not fall asleep through. Um, as for personal writing, I guess it depends on the kind of the writing that you do. But but again, writing from like personal writing for me is a way to get in touch with my shadow anyway. Um, if if you would like to share something more specific, I can try to say something more specific. That was helpful, just as it was. Thank you, Nur. Thank you, Sheila. Tony, please. So I'm trying to think about a, a way to ask my question. So I I have great imagination. I can, you know, vi my way of working is visualization. But mm. with some clients, you know, if I think about using that, that skill of mine, with some clients who have blocked the entire portions of their their life their especially their childhood mm -hmm. you know confronting that what's happening in the room and then working with my own internal sense is is just it's very interesting and i'm still learning my way through that i was just wondering if you might have any perspective on that yeah so basically of course people are really 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 traumatized it's more than just shadow work, right? Shadow work would be just an aspect of what we will be doing with them and with ourselves. And in a way, I consider um, a good shadow work practice should be 90% for ourselves uh, and only 10% to do with our clients. Um, because more often than not, um, we are the limiting factor, not our clients. What we can't be in touch with limits what can happen in the room. And so even if your client isn't doing or isn't being able to be in touch with some really difficult aspects, 
if you can, she'll have a much better chance. That, that's my experience. Um, also with clients who are um, more traumatized, often the transference relationship is more complex. So again, we want to be clear about our shadow so that we're not getting captured blindly into the transference and can work with it more professionally. That's the short answer. The long answer is come to the training. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll say just a few words about the training. Then if there is anyone here who already worked with me and would like to, sh to say a few words about their experience, I'd really appreciate it, but you're not under any obligation, of course. So I hope this was meaningful for you and, it res and that it resonated and, and gave you enough to chew on to have a sense if you like to have more of that. What will we have in a training? The training is a 10 week training. Once a week we'll meet for three and a half hours. We will have time for sharing in questions, time for theory. In each lesson we'll cover different type of theory. So basic shadow stuff and, and the basics of family constellations. Two lessons dedicated for the shadows in the clinic, uh, part of which you've seen today, but not all. Um, cultural shadows, collective shadows, golden shadows, which is related to being envious and jealous and attracted. Um, shadows of helplessness, which is a major topic for any professional helper. Shadows of aggression and vulnerability, that's for you, Sheila. Um, shadows of sexuality and some important points in working with sexual trauma. And the last lesson is shadows of death and goodbye, as death is also an important part of what we're working with uh, with ourselves and with clients. Um, so I chose all the topics which I feel come from the core of what we should be in touch with as, as professionals. This is just the basic training. Afterwards, in January, there is the advanced training, the shadow strikes back, which goes more collective, more into shamanism and witchcraft, and at the same time, more into how to build structures and work more, more finely on the technical aspects of the work. Um, and you have to do the first one to get to the second one. So also another good reason to sign up for this one. Um, we'll have in each session, we'll have self-practice in either a group work or working in pairs. I will also really encourage you to work, to practice with each other in between. There will be a WhatsApp group so that we can have questions and answers and get support. Um, it's a very experiential process. It's not easy work, okay? I may be shooting myself in the leg, but it's not easy work. It, it's intense emotionally. And I re require that you either be in therapy or at least have the phone of a therapist you trust in case you need support and for whatever reason. Um, you will not have to do anything you don't want to do. But just going to the shadow by definition is somewhat challenging. However, it is very rewarding, very powerful, very healing. Um, yeah. I, I consider this basic shadow constellation training as a sort of a roadmap to getting in touch with like major items in your shadow landscape. And I offer myself as a, well, I can say by now an experienced guide uh, to this uh, shadowscape. Having been doing these trainings for the last seven years and this will probably be the 40th training or something like that. Um, I've been doing them in person and online um, in Israel and all over the world. Um, yeah, so if you have questions about a training, um, Kate has all the practical details and she'll share them. She already shared them uh, in the chat. If, if there is anyone here, oh, Kirsten Suarez here will be our uh, um, assistant in the training. Kirsten took both the first and the advanced training with me. 
and she's also a certified facilitator from the Constellation Path School, in addition to all her PPN and her being a midwife and all other good things that she brings. And uh, so uh, baby parts, Kirsten is here to help support you. Um, to come uh, more into the world. Um, if there is anyone who already took the training or did work with me, would like to share your experience with how it affected you, I would really appreciate it. I can share. Hi, Sophie. Thank you. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know what to say, but um, when you said it's heavy, I said, yeah, it's heavy, but it's worth it. So um, I would say, like, it was really intense ten weeks, but without this training, I wouldn't have managed to deal with all the clients I had later then. Mm. It was really, really, really helpful. Like not really that I was using your work that much, but it was like a, the backbone. You gave mm. me a good backbone and I'm really thankful for that. And also mm. thank you for this session. It was, um, yeah, it was really nice. I'm really glad to hear. Thank I can you. recommend like to anyone to work with me. <laughs> Thank you, dear Sophie. Yeah. Bye. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Thank you. Good luck. Kirsten, is there something that you would like to say being our assistant? Yeah, just listening to you near it feels like a long time ago <laughs> that I did the training. And I'm like, oh, I should do this again. So there's, there's, there, it feels like a lifelong journey working with the shadow. Um, and so definitely not going to be in the assistant role because I've mastered all of this myself. <laughs> um, and be careful. I must say, this course was an entryway into my addiction now with family constellation work. Um, there was a way that it it's really opened um, an amazing um, avenue for me. I, I would also say I'm a very visual person, imagery, um, through the PPN training that I've done really developed somatic senses and this work has just deepened and strengthened all of that and it's been really powerful to be able to bring it whether it's in one-on-one -on -one sessions or in groups um, and first and foremost reflecting on what's going on for me um, and just even asking that question like ooh what's going on here? How can I have some tools, some very, very helpful tools to be able to do that reflection, get, get a better sense of what I might need to do to be in a better space, to be able to be more present to whoever I'm trying to be present to, whether it's clients or children or partners or um friend so um really excited about um being with you near i've always felt very you're very humble you're very warm very present um there's quite a bit of ease in being in your presence and i really am thankful for that um and yeah excited to see what comes um so happy to be yeah. your support one of your support people for sure thank you dear kirsten <clears throat> okay hey would you like to say a few words about a tech oh honey you, you have you raised your hand yeah i have a bunch of trainings that are coming up and um I definitely want to take your course and I'm just looking at that might not be able to attend some of the sessions live. Should I wait till I have more free time in my schedule to be able to participate more fully? Well, naturally it's best to be present in all. The requirement is to be present in at least eight out of, out of the 10 lessons. 
and to get a certificate. That's what we found is, uh, and b below that we feel that we, you need to be present in something else to make up for the lost experience. Because watching a video is not the same as we all know. And um, even if you move your yourself through the experience, it's still not the same. Um, Kate, would you like to say a few words about the technicalities, the price, the payments program, whatever? Yes. Well, it starts on the 9th of October. It runs for 10 weeks. The course is three and a half hours each time. Uh, the, we have payment plans. The current price is 950 for the 10 weeks, um, but we have payment pan plans by month, four month, plan three month plan and then a two month plan so if you're interested and you would like to have a different kind of plan please reach out to us we're very flexible with the payments um, but it will be uh, online in zoom uh, our online school will manage it and we'll send you reminders and um, follow up and, and align ourselves with near for communication with you to support you in your learning. Nir, is there any more that you would like for me to say? You say the price and the payment options? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was $950 for all the 10. And then you can pay two, two, uh, two, two, half, yeah, two payments of 475, three payments of 317. Or four payments of two thirty seven fifty so far, so. Yeah, and there is an early bird price, right? Early bird, well, yes, early bird ends September the fourth, um, so early bird is eight hundred and fifty. Yeah. Okay, I think we will actually finish on time, which is really how I like to finish. And um, if you're left with any questions regarding the training, uh, please feel free to contact me um, directly or through Kate if you are more comfortable with that. Um, my email is near.estermanagemail.com and my website is nearesterman.com. Um, also, if you are left from today um, with any overwhelm or difficulty which doesn't go by itself or after a day or, day or two please let me know and i'll help you and uh, disentangle from whatever came up uh, so that you're not uh, <laughs> you're not suffering for nothing uh, in general pain is okay suffering i prefer uh, to minimize and uh, um, because it usually means that we are somehow entangled or somehow fighting things we shouldn't be fighting my email, let's see. Um, got it. Got it. Thank you. Um, I'm really looking forward to see you in this training or in any other way. Um, yeah, thank you for being here today. I appreciate your time. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone.